From 2017 to 2022, Eric Fetty was arguably one of the worst pitchers in all of baseball, and after being released by the Nationals, his career was seemingly over. But after disappearing to South Korea for just one year, he has returned and is dominating MLB. So how did a player nobody wanted suddenly become one of the best pitchers in baseball? Well, to find out, we need to go back to where his career all started. Fetty was born in Las Vegas, Nevada, and growing up, he was a star multi-sport athlete, but ultimately decided on baseball after he developed from a 100-pound, 5'5 kid throwing in the mid-70s his freshman year, all the way to a 6'3 beast, reaching into the 90s as a senior. He even received some great praise from his teammate Bryce Harper, you know, the two-time MVP and future first ballot Hall of Famer. Well, in high school, he had this to say about Fetty. He's a stud. He's somebody that doesn't care which situation he's in, who he's facing, who's at the plate. His heart beats the same way the whole time. And Harper wasn't the only one applauding Fetty, as his coach also mentioned he threw the best slider he had seen in his 27 years of coaching. This makes it no surprise he was heavily recruited out of high school, being taken in the 11th round of the 2011 draft by the San Diego Padres. But instead, he took his talents to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, a D1 program that has produced current MLB players in Bryson Stott, Dean Kramer, and Kyle Isbell. And during his three seasons for the university, which included a stint with the United States Collegiate National Team and a summer in the Cape Cod Baseball League, he excelled, becoming one of the best collegiate pitchers in America. For example, during his junior season, he managed to strike out 11 batters, allowing just one hit in his first game, and by the end of his 11th outing, he was sitting at 8-2 with a 176 ERA and 9.6 strikeouts per 9 making him a consensus top prospect ahead of the 2014 draft, with teams like the Toronto Blue Jays, who owned the 9th and 11th picks, keen on acquiring his services. However, on May 10th, 2014, the University of Las Vegas announced he was undergoing Tommy John surgery, shutting him down for the rest of the year. This was a major setback for Fetty, but despite this, the Washington Nationals felt comfortable enough to take him with the 19th overall pick, stating, He is a plus stuff guy. He's a big physical guy. We add him toward the top of our draft board, and we felt that the risk of him rehabbing and coming back to pre-injury form was worth the draft pick. This was also very in line by the Nationals front office, as they had taken Anthony Rendell Doan, who had shoulder and ankle problems before being drafted in 2011, and Lucas Giolito, who tore a ligament in his elbow before he was taken the following year. And the both of them went on to become big names. They were hoping Fetty could also follow suit. Once he began his minor league career, he was able to revive the talk surrounding his name, going from low A and single A during his first season, to high A and double A the following year. Then in his third season, after starting off at double A, he found himself at triple A in June, and after just 10 games, he was promoted to the Major League roster roster as Nat starter Steven Strasburg went on the injured list. Meaning this wasn't a permanent move, but he had the opportunity to get a feel for the next level, making two starts before being sent back down, with his MLB debut coming on July 30th at home against the Colorado Rockies. Now, at this time, the Rockies weren't the same bottom five team in baseball as they are today. Instead, they were a powerhouse offense with guys like Charlie Blackman, Nolan Arenado, Mark Reynolds, and many more all having big seasons. And in the end, these guys got the better of Fetty as he allowed seven earned runs off 12 base runners in only four innings of work, but he had this to say following the game. You know, I felt like my stuff was pretty good and uh, you know, a lot of balls, you know, landed in good spots for them, but you know, it's one where I still need to make better pitches and get better results. Nonetheless, he was pleased to make his big league debut, a dream of his since he was a kid, but he understood that his first start was not good enough, and he looked to improve on his next outing against the Chicago Cubs. Which, credit to him he did, until everything started to unravel in the sixth inning as he allowed a leadoff homer to Wilson Contreras and then Kyle Schwarber the following batter, giving him a tough final line, but it was an improvement upon his first start. And after he was sent back down due to Gio Gonzalez returning from paternity leave, he was up just a few weeks later, seemingly for the remainder of the season. However, after his outing against the Mets, in which he went six innings allowing five earned runs, something seemed off. His fastball, which is typically sitting in the mid-90s, was only reaching the high 80s, and because of this, he was shut down out of an abundance of caution with a flexor strain in his forearm as a way to give him a leg up on getting ready the following spring. And while season-ending injuries are always a tough way to end the year, it was still a productive one for Fetty, as he started the campaign at AA, made his MLB debut in August, and was named the Nationals Pipeline Pitcher of the Year. He was also able to use the longer offseason to prepare for 2018, where he showed out in spring training, tossing a 2.45 ERA in 14 and two-thirds innings pitched. 
But despite this, he started the season at AAA, later getting promoted to the big league roster in late May. And this started a trend for Fetty as he was recalled and optioned by the Nationals a total of six times in 2018. And in the end, he managed 11 starts at the major league level, but he couldn't find much success tossing a 5.54 ERA in his 50 and a third innings pitched. Yeah, safe to say it was not the way most anticipated the top prospect season to go. He even mentioned during the offseason that he needed to get to work. Kind of tr changed up a little bit of training this year and uh, yeah, already up 15 pounds, so yeah, it's a good start. I think it's maybe my last year of options. It's a you know big one just to kind of prove that you know I belong. I mean, I'm just going to fight for everything I can and you know the goal is to you know go out there and prove that I should be an everyday guy. But unfortunately for Fetty, 2019 was much like the year prior in that he was transferred between the majors and minors a total of five times. And when he was with the Major League squad, he was about as average as you could get, shown by his 4.5 ERA and exactly league average 100 ERA+. So, the Nationals decided to leave him off their playoff roster despite him finishing the season in the bullpen, and they would go on to win the World Series without him. But he didn't feel petty about the situation, stating you have to look at it as a once in a lifetime experience. Not being stressed out knowing I was probably going to pitch, I was able to take time to look at the surroundings and enjoy the crowd and just the whole atmosphere of the situation. He was also as happy as could be celebrating their parade in DC, but it's hard to think that deep down he wasn't a little jealous he couldn't pitch on the biggest stage in the world. So heading into 2020, he once again got to work with the same goal of putting on muscle, as he believed it's what led him to being fully healthy in 2019. And he did this by working out in his hometown with fellow MLB pitcher Max Fried, where the two worked on arm action. And this offseason of training helped him win his first opening day roster spot of his career. He would also go on to have his best season with the Nats, posting a 4.29 ERA, 104 ERA+, and the longest start of his career in his final outing against the Phillies, going seven strong scoreless frames. Momentum he looked to continue to build upon in 2021, but instead of the upward trajectory he found himself on the previous few years, it all came crashing down. Despite logging the most starts of his career at 27 and most innings at 133 and a third, his ERA ranked as the 11th worst in baseball among pitchers with 100 innings and third worst in terms of war at negative 1.1. Flash forward to 2022, his ERA jumped closer to 6, the second worst in baseball, only besting fellow teammate Patrick Corbin. And with his contract only getting more expensive through arbitration, the Nationals decided not to tender him a deal for the 2023 season. And at this point, it felt like his career was done because over the previous eight years he was riddled with injuries going on the 60-day injury list twice due to his forearm and shoulder as well as many smaller ailments that also made him miss time and in total he logged 454 and a third innings pitched for a cumulative era of 5.41 for reference from the point of his debut till 2022 that figure ranked as the lowest in all of baseball which makes it no surprise that teams weren't lining up to acquire his services once he hit free agency. In fact, all he could get were minor league deals. So he decided to bet on himself and sign a one-year deal worth the maximum $1 million foreigner salary with the NC Dinos in South Korea. As mentioned, this used to be a death sentence to one's career, with teams putting a big X mark on players who left to Eastern Asia. But lately, that's been changing. For instance, Miles Michaelis has managed a great MLB career after spending three years in Japan, Merrill Kelly helped bring the D-backs to the World Series after four years in Korea, and fellow NC Dino Eric Thames spent three years with the club before coming back to America and becoming one of the most powerful players in all of baseball. This was the type of career rejuvenation Fetty was looking for, and like these players, he was able to shine overseas. In his lone season in Korea, he managed the most wins at 20, the lowest ERA at 2, and the league leading 209 strikeouts, helping him take home not only the KBO Triple Crown Award, but also the KBO MVP, the club's first since Eric Thames won it back in 2015. And I understand this was Korea, a league scouts like to put on par with the AA, but that doesn't matter. What does are the changes Fetty made to his arsenal, something he hadn't been able to develop in MLB, stating, Sometimes it's hard to work on things in the big league. So you're trying to get outs and that's what really matters but i went over there and could throw my change up 25 times and figure it out and throw my sweeper 25 times and figure it out and you know it's tough when you maybe get through the minors and you haven't done that enough 
He would continue to mention, I feel like most of us that are in the big leagues have had times where we feel like we're the best pitcher on the field. Getting back to that can sometimes be tough when you've been beat up. But I think I gained a ton of confidence and like I said, when you feel like you have the tools to get people out, it leads you to that sense of confidence again. And because of these changes he made overseas, he once again grabbed MLB team's attention, ultimately signing with the Chicago White Sox on a two-year $15 million deal, giving us our first look at him in the state since 2022 and it's clear his his game has changed massively. In 2022, he used primarily a sinker at 40% of the time, followed by a curveball and cutter he used around 30% each, and finally a changeup at 3%. But in Korea, he got rid of his curveball entirely, and instead focused on a sinker and cutter mix 60% of the time, and then an off-speed pitch in the changeup and breaking ball in the sweeper at 20% each. Let's focus on those two pitches for now, because for the majority of his career, he didn't have an elite off-speed or breaking pitch he could rely on to get batters out. In 2022, his most used breaking pitch was the curve, and opponents hit 321 with a 504 slug against it, which ranked as the second worst curve in all of baseball. And because batters weren't getting fooled off his breaking ball, they were able to gear up for his fastball. But now, with his brand new sweeper, he's using 20% of the time, he's allowed opponents to just a 184 average and 382 slug against it. A massive improvement. And moving over to his off-speed pitch, his changeup. At the moment, he's throwing it 20% of the time compared to just 3 in 2022. It is also far more dominant than it ever was before. And it all stems from a change in grip, allowing the pitch to be on average 2 miles per hour faster with 1.4 inches less of vertical movement and 3.1 less of horizontal, helping his opponents to just a 216 average and 295 slug against it, compared to the 364 average and 545 slug they had in 2022. And on top of all of this, by having these two new pitches that are now fooling batters, his fastball is able to play far more effectively, helping him create swing and miss on his heater better than he ever had in his career. This change in his pitching arsenal has helped him go from as mentioned one of the worst pitchers in baseball from 2017 to 2022 to a solid front of the line arm. For reference, since coming back to the states, he has a 2.98 ERA in 20 starts, stretching across 117 and two thirds innings pitched. He also has a 7-3 record, and I know that isn't a stat that should be used to value a player. However, when the team has the worst ranked offense in baseball and has less than 30 wins, that's a pretty big accomplishment. But perhaps the coolest part about his 2024 season came on May 14th when he was in complete control against his former team, going 7 strong scoreless innings, allowing just 3 base runners and striking out 6. A start he was very grateful to make. And this all stems from the determination he had to reinvent himself in Korea after his lackluster spell in DC, something not many players would be willing to do. But he bet on himself and is reaping the rewards. It's been no doubt one of the best stories in all of baseball this season.